And thanks everyone for uh, being here at Back Pain Day. Uh, of course, we're now in the middle of the second half of the day, and I just want to ask everyone to reach into your, the goodie bag um, that you received this morning when you checked in. The reason is uh, we have a handout in there. It says chronic pain on the front, and if you're watching on the stream at home, uh, this is available on our, on our website, stanfordhealthcare.org slash pain. Or if you're watching this recorded video and binge watching it, you can find it on our website as well. Um, now, why do I want to pull this out? It's because I like to help everyone kind of um, understand the, the context of what we're discussing here. Here we are talking about comprehensive. For the, for the course of the day, we've been talking about a comprehensive multimodal pain management for chronic low back pain. And that includes, excuse me? Louder? Oh. OK, would do. Thank you. So we have been talking about uh, multi multimodal pain management. And the purpose of pulling this out um, and really understanding the various components of pain management is so that I can properly place in context the true role of medications in pain management for chronic low back pain. I'd like to start with a case. It's actually a hypothetical case. It's a amalgam of various patients I've seen over the years. Now, there are some patients who are particularly, particularly sensitive to medications. And um, so this guy, who has chronic back pain I'm seeing in my clinic, uh, would tell me that he has tried so many medications and none of which he can tolerate. Now, there are some medications he liked, as in they were helpful for him, but the side effects were too overwhelming and he had to stop. He could take it for a few days, but he could not continue. He would tell me that he would take the lowest dose formulation of this medication. He would open up the capsule. He would count the granules, 120 or so, and he would take a fraction of that. So with it, he had less effect for sure, but he also had less side effects. By altering the balance of effect and side effect, he was able to take this medication chronically. And he would tell me that he had more relief after that. Now, by this point, if there's any pharmacists in the audience, um, you're probably fainting. <laughs> I'm not recommending that we do this in general. What I would recommend for this patient is that I would uh, prescribe a compounding pharmacy prescription so that this ultra-low dose medication can be made available to him. So why do I bring this up? A case like this illustrates the various aspects of pain medication used in a chronic setting that's very unique. Very unique, poorly appreciated, and I think uh, very important for all of us to understand. So I'm going to circle back to some of the fundamental principles underlying medication use in chronic pain management. I'm going to yet take another step back and just talk a little bit again about the epidemiology of back pain, which Dr. Mackey had covered this morning. We know that back pain is increasingly common amongst Americans. This is data across the, the last 15 years or so. And each patient with chronic low back pain is increasingly likely to receive opioid medications as the primary mode of treatment. And we heard from Dr. Newmark this morning, that is not an ideal solution. In fact, just a few weeks ago, uh, all clinicians, physicians, nurse practitioners, and um, physician assistants across the country received a letter in their mailbox from the Surgeon General himself, Dr. Vivek Murthy. In this letter, he outlined and reminded all clinicians around the country that opioid medications have their role in acute pain management, but when used in chronic pain setting, it causes more problems, it contributes to misuse, abuse, diversion, and addiction. And he recommends that clinicians be wary of these uh, issues and then manage chronic pain more appropriately. The question now becomes, of course, from the clinician's point of view, our interest is to help patients, not to get patients into trouble with medications. From individual patients' point of view, the interest is well aligned. Patients do not want to take medications that are not helpful. So if both sides agree on this being, this, uh, being not the solution, why do we reach for it? Why do we reach for the wrong solution? It's because it's the easy one. I'll explain a little bit more why. In fact, there are 200 medications in pain management. Only about 20 are opiate medications. And opiate medications work fast. And when used in an acute setting, they're obviously helpful. 
but many other medications in pain, the 180 that are left, that are not narcotic, that are not opioid, that are not addictive, are harder to, um, to use as a group because first of all, there are so many. In fact, if you really did the math and you find that for every medication, any given patient can be on it or off it, so you do that across the board for uh, 180 medications, the number of combinations of medications we can try for any given patient is actually more than the number of atoms in the universe. So uh, I, I wouldn't recommend uh, an exhaustive search uh, uh, in this process. So this is why, in my opinion, opiate medications have been used as a primary medication for chronic pain. Now, among the non-opiate medications, um, my guess is many of you have at least tried some of these medications. These are some of our most common ones, right? Starting from the top left, we have gabapentin and pregabalin. To the bottom right, we have topiramate oxcarbazepine. Each and every one of these medications has, has unique side effects, its unique effects, its unique mechanism, and each of which has its own role. Now, they do cluster into certain functional groups. So some are anti-inflammatory, others are muscle relaxants and they can all work together. So on the left here is a little graph we put together that summarizes everything we know in the literature about the neurobiology of consciousness. The reason I put this up here is because it's so, pain pathways are so complicated. If you studied consciousness, you find that the main vein that runs through the pathway for consciousness all have to do with pain, pleasure, motivation, and action the very fundamental recipes for survival. So what that means is there are many, many ways in which pain, well, these pathways can uh, malfunction, therefore causing pain. The flip side of that is there are many, many places where we can intervene. Hence, we need all 200 medications at our disposal. Uh, if we dive in a little bit more to the, some of the pathological mechanisms of chronic pain, now other speakers today have uh, touched upon this, so I'm not gonna talk about all of them except to point out uh, the middle, the one in the middle, the central sensitization, that's really the, the key to chronic pain initiation and maintenance to the beginning and ongoing um, continuation of chronic pain. Now the 200 medications each will treat different aspects of these mechanisms. Uh, I don't think we have enough time to talk about 200 medications today, but, but we will talk about some of the principles in which we can make this a more feasible problem to solve. All right, so choosing non-opiate medications is hard because there are many and because each is different. So when you see your pain doctor, that's the task your pain doctor is facing and that's the task you're facing as well. How can we make it easier? So um, of course, educational efforts around the country uh, led by Dr. Mackey and the National Pain Strategy, that's one key part of the solution. But what I would like to also give you today will be a set of recommendations that you can walk away with that when you work with your pain doctors on an ongoing basis, this will help you find the right set of non-opioid medications that can be helpful for you. All right, so first, we're going to address the very common refrain from some patients about pain medications perhaps hiding their pain. Now this is a very, in, in many ways, a conceptually reasonable concern because the, the mental model we have of pain typically is, for example, say a paper cut. If I sustain a paper cut, it hurts because there's a nerve that's irritated by the cut. And uh, on the model here on the left, we have a neuron, a nerve, that's trying to transmit signal to the neuron on the, on the right, telling it that there has been a small injury with a paper cut. On the, on the receiving end, now it has received, uh, the nerve has received the signal, so therefore now it knows there's an injury and therefore experience of pain. That's the acute pain setting, and it makes sense that we worry about hiding the pain because we would like to know if we're sustaining actual injury. But that's not what's happening in chronic pain. Chronic neck pain, chronic back pain, all sorts of chronic pain work differently. It relies on the concept called central sensitization we mentioned earlier, where a steady, consistent, persistent barrage of pain signals coming from the nerve from the left is now impacting the nerve on the right in such a way that by virtue of its consistency and persistence it causes changes in the synapses, therefore initiation of centralized uh, pain, so central sensitization. 
this is the core of chronic pain. It's characteristically, qualitatively different from acute pain. So non-opiate medications do not hide the pain. What they do do is to reduce the amount of signals that's being passed from the left to the right so that this process of central sensitization, first of all, can be reduced, in fact, can be undone. So as in reduction of your chronic pain over time. All right. We talked a little bit earlier about the dosage of medications. In fact, we find this very frequently in our clinical practice. Every patient reacts differently to the same medications at the same doses. Each medication is unique in terms of its, its mechanism. Every patient is unique. All of us have six billion base pairs of DNA, and each of us can be different in many of the 40 million ways we can be different, the so-called genetic variants. So the bottom line of that is there's a degree, there's only so much that clinicians can predict what your response will be to any given medication. So therefore, there will be a little bit of a trial, pro, trial and error process that's involved in finding the right set of medications for you. What we usually recommend, and uh, when you work with your pain physician and the clinician, you can go for this as well, which is to start medications at a low dose and it increases slowly. Start at a low dose so that you can figure out if you can tolerate this medication. And it increases slowly so that you give your body a chance to get used to it. And what's also important is to record uh, your side effects and your reactions to medications to your prescribers. That will help the prescriber move on, um, either continue the medication, changing its dose, or finding an alternative. So these are inf inf import uh, important information that your prescribers will find very valuable. All right, so here's a very interesting uh, concept, I think, in, in chronic pain management that's um, I find counterintuitive. Our mental model of taking pain medications is, for example, reaching for the Tylenol, reaching for the Advil when something hurts. It's more analogous to the way we take antibiotics. If there's an infection, we take antibiotic. If the infection is clear, we will stop the antibiotic. But chronic pain medication, the non-opioid medications, are typically taken more like a blood pressure medication. As in, you take your blood pressure medications, regardless of your blood pressure, on a given day, for the most part, and you would take it daily for days, for weeks, for months in order to derive the most benefit. The same principle is true for chronic pain medications that are non-opioid. In fact, many medications that work on the consciousness pathway we talked about earlier rely on the body's response to the presence of the medication in order for it to be effective. As in, the medication itself doesn't cause or doesn't help with pain management. It's more so the body's response to it that helps it. So therefore, the timeline for that is in the order of weeks to months. So you, some, for some medications, we'll say you have to try it for two months before we can come to a conclusion about whether or not it's helpful for you. And that's an important concept because, I'm, so first of all, I'm sorry, it does prolong, it does prolong the process of finding the right solution. Yet on the other hand, some of these medications that work slowly are some of the best medications we have in pain management. Uh, so the more uh, you can work with your pain physician on this, I think the more benefit and more value you will get out of that interaction. Oh, this is my uh, public service announcement slide. Uh, <laughs> that remember we talked about how pain is, a, is a, such a fundamental driver of our consciousness. Pain distracts us. Pain sucks away all of our attention, keeps us from doing the things we want to do. Same thing is true for all the other parts of healthcare. As in, I see many patients who are so engrossed with going after that pain that they neglected their colonoscopies, they neglected their mammographies, neglected to check their cholesterol, check their blood pressure. These are fundamental aspects of, health, aspects of healthcare that you have to keep it, uh, pay attention to so that overall you have, uh, well, your health is well and well maintained. So it's an important thing uh, to pay attention to. Lastly, we again reach back to this map of chronic pain management, of multimodal pain management, and ask why do we even take medications at all? It takes, it's a complicated problem. The easy solution is opioids, but it's, opioids give us all kinds of side effects. The hard, well the non-opioids medications on the, on the other hand are extremely hard. 
we talked about it's how it's more than the number of atoms in the universe. Why do we even bother with this tough problem? It's because medications are not in, in and of itself. It's a means to an end. It's a means to help you participate more in physical therapy, to partic participate in psychology, to optimize your nutrition, to get better sleep at night. And it's a tool so that you can participate in the, re in the rest of the multimodal pain management. If you keep that in mind, I think you'll get a lot more value out of working with your pain physician. And um, thank you. <laughs> Did you show the slide of the non-opioid medications? They're not the, the yes. clock and in front of you. Also, I noticed gabapentin, at, in my experience, is the one that is most been suggested. Is it because there's the most studies on it, or why? Or it's just my experience? It is certainly. It's. Um, I think for all the ex factors you have mentioned, it is one of our uh, go-to medications. Can we have the slideshow back on, please? Now, gabapentin, now we, uh, we talked about how we have 200 medications in pain management. Gabapentin is always number one on our list because, uh, because of the effective, effectiveness and because of how safe it is. Uh, we have a joke that um, the only way to be harmed by gabapentin, because it's so safe, is to be hit by the truck that's carrying the gabapentin. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, oh, well, <laughs> it's so safe that the only way to be harmed by gabapentin is to be hit by the truck that's carrying it. <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, you know, we, we, we talk about it because we want to emphasize how safe it is. And it's our first go-to medication in most instances, in particular, in particular for chronic low back pain, where we want to offer patients a non-narcotic alternative. It's a great question, thank you. And I, the way I see these medications is recognizing the fact. Oh, let, let me repeat the question, excuse me. The question really is about, is about um, alterations, um, alterations in non-narcotic pain uh, dosage um, in response to changes in levels of pain whether or not we should increase versus decrease pain uh, medication doses as the pain fluctuates on some good days and bad days. And my response to that is um, I would prefer that my patients re change doses um, in a deliberate way, as in uh, having discussed with a physician, with a prescribing physician, so that there's a plan. So, so on some days, we, well, we can increase the dose over the course of a couple of weeks, for example, or reduce the dose on the course of a couple of weeks. And it's because I don't want the patients to find themselves paying, really spending the entire day looking, you know, trying to measure their own pain and therefore trying to gauge the amount of medications that they take. I want um, these medications to be, well, I want the patients to spend more time doing things that they like to do and be more doing functional activities. Um, I would say these small changes in doses are less likely to be immediately helpful and uh, it's much better to maintain a consistent dose. Now, with that being said, I will occasionally offer patients an extra dose of benign medications, for example, like gabapentin. Now, does not apply to across the board, but some medications are um, good and can be taken on an additional as-needed basis so that patients can do more physical therapy. Usually, I ask them to take it 30 minutes before activities, for example. When you said that we take pain medications, we should take them like we take blood pressure medications, that you should take it every day. My understanding was I take pain medications when I have pain that's basically interfering with my life. But you're saying that it's important to take it consistently. Yeah, so the question is a good one. Um, it was, I was speaking in terms of the most medications in pain management that are non-narcotic in nature. So medications just like gabapentin and many of the medications on this list, they work most effectively when they're taken on a consistent basis because they induce changes in your brain circuitry such that the pain uh, is reduced. That's not apply to every single medication, I should emphasize, and thank you for bringing this point up, that um, you should really chat with your prescriber, your pain physician, your pain clinician, um, regarding your medications and how to take them properly. My second question was, it's, it's like, it seems like 
pain medications and anti-inflammatories, NASIDs, are kind of mixed together, and yet I think they're very separate. Um, can you explain why, you know, on this list you have both NASIDs and pain medications, or what I consider pain medications, mm -hmm. and as if they were the same thing? Got it. Um, so I'm saying what is... Right, so, so I think your question is about uh, what is unique about NSAIDs, the anti-inflammatory medications, and do they, do they even belong on the list of pain medications? Um, I would say that it is true that NSAIDs, as defined, they're non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Their primary action is reduction of inflammation, but many of them also have analgesic properties, as in reduction of pain in and of itself. In fact, so much so that uh, if you look at the NSAID as a class, some medications will have more anti-inflammatory effect and less analgesic, and other medications in a different direction. So each and one, every one of them has a different balance. Now, for that reason, because they do have independent analgesic effects, um, I have listed that in this, um, uh, in this table. NSAIDs are important to point out because um, even though many of the NSAIDs are over-the-counter, they do have their side effects when taken uh, chronically over the course of months and years. So therefore, these medications need to be discussed with your pain prescriber um, uh, regarding your, uh, the way you take it. Thank you. You can see uh, all the interest there is in medications. And so we're going to bring Dr. Cowett again a little bit later when we do a panel Q&A towards the end. In the meantime, we're going to turn it back to Dr. Darnell, who's going to introduce our next speaker. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Cow.